Hi, my name is Sebastian and I'm very happy to give this presentation on the topic of testing, which is called tests that spark flow. So yes, I'm a big believer in the importance of tests and especially on what I chose this title um, to show that actually this can be a flow experience, it can be fun to test our software. This presentation is especially targeted for enterprise software, but the principles apply to all kinds of software and all kinds of Java things that we write. So my name is Sebastian, born and raised in Munich, Germany, and I work for this company called IBM. And I typically do a lot of things with enterprise Java. So everything that is important to an enterprise Java project and testing is definitely um, an important topic there. And what I will show in this presentation is mostly uh, focused on so-called uh, system tests or acceptance tests. And especially I want to show different uh, ways how to um, test our applications, especially locally, in just a way where it's more efficient, where it's more fun um, because of short uh, turnaround times and we don't have to wait for anything. So that is uh, the most important thing. And also what sometimes is a little bit lacking if you watch some presentations or read some articles about testing is that it's complex enough. The examples that have uh, been shown that it's not just, you know, hello world, then it's kind of easy because that is what um, is the challenge in enterprise projects, in real world projects that you actually have quite some complex scenarios, a lot of interaction, especially with microservices. And this is why I want to show you an example of well, coffee, because I love coffee. I'm a big coffee nerd. So I have a coffee shop example for you where we have the application in the middle that actually we would like to verify. And this coffee shop, well, already has some persistence. So at least, you know, that's a little bit more complex. And then the user can go, go and order some coffee and then asynchronously. And that's because, you know, to make it a little bit more uh, interesting, to make it a little bit more complex, we have a communication with a second backend, uh, a second microservice that is called Barista, you know, like the friendly person who brews your coffee. And uh, in this case, I mostly want to focus on how to validate that the coffee shop application, that's the one we develop in a team, um, works as expected in terms of the overall integration. So what I have, I have a Quarkus project. I use Quarkus uh, technology to uh, write this coffee shop application. And now I actually want uh, right away uh, to test it or to just show you um, what it looks like. And I want to just uh, build that up locally. So basically I have a Maven uh, project that has been built. I use uh, Java 14 and Quarkus in a quite recent version. And uh, with that, I'm just building this project and I now run it. Um, as local local Docker containers. So I want to verify this just locally with, you know, local host. And the reason why I have Docker containers, I have three containers, one for the coffee shop application, one for the barista backend, and one for a database. So I want to have a very um, real world um, a scenario or a scenario that is actually close to the real world. Why? Because then we test something that is very close to what we later have in production. And this is a quite interesting or quite important uh, theme. Um, that we say uh, we have something that matches production as closely as possible. Why? Because every configuration change that we have, everything that is different, then later on might fail. So if you look into 12 factor applications, um, you know, keep environments as similar as possible, don't have separate binary builds. If you have uh, to have differences, use external configuration. So now we have three Docker containers, one for the coffee shop, one for the barista and one for the database. And that is um, already with locally uh, published ports. So we can have something like, uh, let me make this bigger, localhost uh, 8001, um, which is basically a JSON res uh, response that comes from our Quarkus application that says, well, we have some coffee orders, some coffee types, some drink types. So basically we can um, go and order some coffee here using the coffee shop application. And now since everything here is started, let me just show you how this works. So we basically can go to the orders, which is a resource for, you know, all coffee orders. And as you can see here, that is empty. There is no order in the system yet. So I can quickly uh, show you the uh, resource for that. If you know Quarkus, then you know you can use these JaxRS Jakarta APIs. So that's pretty cool. We can use slash orders and you know, here there's a brief response of what's going on. I don't want to go uh, too much into detail. Of course, you have access to all of the source code, but basically what we have here, 
we create an order and we persist it into a database. And an order looks roughly as follows, that this is persisted uh, via JPA. We have um, something like a coffee type, which is a drink type, and a coffee origin. So, you know, that's something like espresso or a cappuccino. And uh, for the nicer coffee shops, actually, you can select the origin where your beans come from. So, for example, to say, you know, I would like to have a coffee from Colombia and things like that. So this is actually what I uh, what I can do. So I'm now just posting something. And again, I use curl uh, here to just show you the point, how it works, how an API, how this API could be used. And let's say I would like to order, that means post some JSON uh, with type espresso and origin, let's say, uh, Colombia, something like this. And then I did not check the header. Yes, 201 created. That's good news. So apparently the coffee's in the system, right? And now if I ask for the list of all orders, I would like to see, well, now these two orders. And I could check out the link to get uh, some more information. And also what I see, it has some status here. So let's do this again. If I'm fast enough, at first uh, the status was preparing, then it is finished, and then it is collected. That means that uh, the barista person is actually doing some work, and asynchronously that's going to happen here. All right, so that is already interesting to see because now I actually would like to validate this. I would like to test it in a proper way. I could argue while well, I already tested it, right? So locally it works, right? It works on my machine. And I, you know, I have a setup that is quite uh, similar to what runs later on, if I later on also use containers. But the challenge here is, well, I only tested it once. I have no regression. So if I change something tomorrow, I don't know if it still works. So of course, I would like to have a proper test. And for that reason, I now have uh, what I sometimes call, um, so, you know, with test scope names, it depends because they're somewhat overused. Everybody uses names a little bit differently. Um, for me, and I also in, call them in my book, system tests or acceptance tests, which in this case is a test that tests the application under a test. In my case, that's the coffee shop. That's the one I want to test in the same way. And ideally, that's really as close as possible to production. Uh, when it comes to configuration, networking, and all of these things, um, like I have it later on, and with external dependencies potentially being mocked. Potentially means, while this really depends what we're doing, for example, with a database, it could be just easier to run the same data database technology, for example, in a container. Docker containers really help here a lot. Or for the barista, if that is, for example, some complex logic that is not interesting uh, to us, maybe develop a other team, I could also use a mock server such, uh, such as WireMock to just run this as an actual application, but as a mock server application. But for a coffee shop, this looks in the very same way, similarly um, as the actual barista backend. So let's start right away. How this works, I typically use a separate project, a system test project that does not reuse the code of my uh, production um, project. Why? Uh, because to not have uh, to accidentally uh, reuse some code. So for example, if you change one thing on the one side and then uh, on the other side, it also just uh, changes without uh, some having some unwanted changes. So I actually want to keep it similar. Why? This is a running application and I could use any technology that speaks HTTP here to just verify my application. I could use, you know, bash scripts if I want. I could use Python, something else. But in my case, I argue that if I'm a Java developer, if the team is um, used to Java technology, it just makes sense to stick with that and to use, you know, the testing technology such as uh, JUnit to just drive our tests. Other than that, I want to have it be very standalone. That means I connect to an already running application. I will talk a little bit more later on why this is the case, why I advocate to use it that way. And for now, um, let's have a create order naive test. There's a reason why I call this naive. I'll show you in a second. But basically what I would like to do, I would like to verify in a Java way what I just did on a command line. I would like to say, well, please create the very, uh, you know, create and verify um, some order. So create a coffee order and verify that whether that's in the system. So for example, I could say, well, here, what do I need to do? Well, we need to kind of HTTP post something there, right, with our JSON that we just have. So I could go and say, okay, new order, Espresso Colombia, right, and now please create a JSON by it. That's the JSON P API. And this is actually JaxRS on the client side. You could use, you know, any HTTP client of your choice. Um, but in my case, it's, you know, a Quarkus project, so I have access to JaxRS already. 
and um, or this system test is not a Quarkus project, but I'm I'm used to use uh, um, JaxRS. Um, that's why I use it. So I advocate to use a similar technology and frameworks that you usually use in your project. And in this case, you know, I do something like a post here and I check whether it's successful status. I get the location header. If you remember, this was like the response header that I have here that just points to my uh, coffee order. Why? Because then if it has been created successfully, I can actually go and load the order and assert whether, you know, the information matches. So whether the type and the origin matches here. So for example, I could go later on and say, well, curl local host and this was too much and uh, just ask for the order and then say, okay, actually this is an espresso from Colombia. So I could then verify this as well. Okay, so is this a good idea? Well, I don't know. I've seen such tests or such test code many, many, many times. So this is basically the straightforward naive way, hence the name to write it just down one after another what you do, but this is not necessarily the, the best way. And now with, uh, we're tackling two issues here. So first of all, uh, about the scope, how we would like to test, but now also with how we would like to write our tests and especially how we would um, like to use delegation and abstraction, which is probably the most important principle uh, in, in computer science uh, abstraction to just well, work on an abstraction level that works for us. Because the challenge here is, this is a quite uh, long method, but the problem is it's not that it's the method is too long or that it does too much. The problem is it works on too many abstraction levels at the same time. Why? Because, well, you don't really know what's going on here, right? We, we kind of mix a responsibility. So first of all, what is our test scenario? What actually do we like to test? Well, we would like to test the creation of a coffee order with espresso in Colombia, right? And then at the same time, we also have all of these low level details, right? Like, okay, you need to post some JSON to this and then, you know, check the status code and this header and blah, 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 blah. And now the challenge is what happens. Uh, we know, first of all, that's not a problem, right? I mean, where, where does the problem come into play? Well, you probably can assume it and you've been there. What happens if something changes? So if tomorrow I have not only espresso from Colombia, but cappuccino and Colombia, right? So, well, of course, you know what happens. I go and take this method and, you know, copy and paste it. And then basically go here and say, well, now Cappuccino, I hope I write this correctly, Cappuccino. Um, and then, of course, this um, name clashes. So create very um, Cappuccino order. And you get the point, then it becomes basically quite quickly unmaintainable. Why? Because now this is already some code which I really have to read closely in order to understand it. And now I have two of these crazy methods. And now imagine if I not only have Colombia, but Ethiopia, then, you know, these the number of permutations here pretty much explode. So let me undo this. This is basically not the best idea. And all of that, it wasn't a good idea. So let me write this in a pseudocode again, or in comments, actually. And this is not a joke. I quite often do this. Um, in projects. So use a whiteboard or some paper or here some comments. What do I want to test? That is the important question. And just start from the beginning. Don't start with, you know, these lower level details. Why? Because this is a system test from ideally your user's perspective. User could be the user of an API, right? But those users don't care about JSON or HTTP or whatever. Chances are they don't know about it. So what would I like to do? Well, create order with Espresso. Uh, with type espresso and origin Colombia. That's it, right? Create an order with espresso and Colombia. How you do this, I don't know. I don't care. The test scenario just says what do you would like to test? Well, and I would like to test the creation of this order. And then also please um, uh, verify um, that order. And now, well, how do you identify it? Well, I basically need to kind of uh, save order ID, right? Something like this. And verify that order with order ID. Well, basically saying something like has type espresso and origin Colombia. So basically create the order in the system and verify that now the order is persisted in the system with the correct information. You know, that's a very simple test, create something and check if it's there, right? And you test a lot of things implicitly already, you know, whether the database a connection works and all of these things. And well, that's it. And if you write it in this way, of course, this doesn't work. These are just comments. But if you write your code in this way, then it's really readable. Why? Because you immediately see 
great order espresso colombia okay ideally you also uh, name that test properly and you see what's going on it's only a few lines of codes and more importantly you're working on the same abstraction level we're not talking about http and json i don't care i care about order espresso colombia the other test might be order from cappuccino with cappuccino from colombia and things like that so then you immediately see what you actually want to test what is your test scenario how it's implemented different story so with that i want to show you a different type of test that now implements this a little bit better how it would look in java great verify order now what we have well it's super simple and well almost too simple to tell you but actually this is not something new right we do this all the time it's delegation and using proper abstraction the only difference is this is test code and it's not forbidden to care about proper test code quality it's actually a good idea right with production code we do this all the time but with test code it's also important why maintainability and readability create verify order create a new order with espresso from colombia okay coffee order system create order uh-huh so this coffee order system is apparently some type of delegate and it's very simple right like very simple technology plain j unit i'll talk about this a little bit later and we just you know instantiate this and then whatever it does create order okay great create the order if you don't blow up and through exceptions then it probably hopefully works and then i get some identify in this case it's a uri but it could be you know whatever a business identifier i want and then load the order get the order again from this identifier and see you know what information you have and then just see you know assert that type and origin matches or assert whatever and this and that and bonus points if you get the list of all orders and check whether this order is also included okay great that's it that's the test scenario what we would like to verify so on a system test level that is very very helpful to just keep them um, in this way and to use abstraction and uh, proper delegation well, to separate these things, to separate these abstraction layers. Why? Well, now let's have a look in how the coffee order system is implemented. And this actually, you know, talks about HTTP, connect to localhost or to wherever, use JSON, use all of these status codes. And now if the underlying protocol changes, if you swap HTTP to something else, if you swap JSON to something else, then this doesn't matter. Why? Because you only have to change this class. And if you have well, that's the point, not only one test, but ultimately hundreds of different of tests because your software functionality grows, then you don't have to implement all of these changes in your tests. I imagine this naive test before, if you have hundreds of these classes, you can forget it, you can throw them away, right? You, you're screwed, that's, uh, that won't repair itself uh, anymore. But with this, it's actually quite simple to say, okay, I want to build up another method similar to that, but now I want to have some order with cappuccino or whatever, or if the underlying logic changes, well, this API of this class ideally doesn't change at all. And then you can implement the changes right there. In the same way, if the system test here changes, then you can implement it there. You don't have to adapt this class. And ideally that is being reused. All right, so this already um, works um, here, or actually, I don't know if it works. Let's uh, try this out. I have another a system test environment. Why? Because um, actually my um, barista works a little bit different. What I will show you. Why? Because now also I would like to control this barista in some system test and verify whether it works. Why? Well, I want to know whether this arrow, whether the connection here is also correct, right? Whether not only my coffee shop stores everything, but also whether it sends the correct data to the barista. So I would like to test all of the boundaries of my application in this system test. How do I do this? Well, I basically swap my barista and here I have a class with a wire mock. So that's a mock server technology. It's basically an HTTP server that, that mocks some stuff and I can control it here. I basically connect to this and say, hey, by the way, if you will be called with the um, with the appropriate API, so that's slash processes uh, here, then please return a uh, accordingly for a specific order and so on and so forth. So I basically, you know, it's very similar to Mokito on a code level test, what I can do, and I can just tell and instruct it how to do that. So. Let's do create order check status update. What I do, I create a coffee order again, but now I actually care about the status field, whether all of this ping pong logic works as expected. So I say, hey, dear barista, please answer for the order in the correct status, you know, and then load it again, check whether the status has been updated. 
And now what I do because it's asynchronous, I basically have to say, well, now wait until this communication occurs until the barista backend is actually being invoked. And then I see, you know, what happens, I can actually ask it. And there, well, is no much better way than just pull and wait with a timeout to say, okay, have you been invoked after time because it's asynchronous, I have no guarantee whether it works immediately. And that is basically how we can structure this here. And now if you imagine, this is still kind of readable if you see for the statuses. But if you would have it without these delegates, it would be a mess, you know, it would be a few hundred lines of codes, prob uh, code probably, and nobody would comprehend what works here. So then it's really, really crucial to have some, you know, um, nice uh, readable names and the proper um, um, abstraction and delegation. So now let's actually try this out. I would like to finally run some tests. And again, I run uh, these tests with plain J unit and they connect to a system that's already running. So once my IDE wakes up, or I can of course also run them from the command line, these tests run actually very fast. So the first test immediately returns or quite quickly within you know a second or two. The second test takes a little bit longer. Why? Well, the second test takes longer because that's the nature of the use case, because this ping pong logic goes on uh, a few times. And actually, you know, there's a timer with two or three seconds each. So you have to wait for a bit. But that's the nature of the use case. That's not the test. So when it comes to tests that spark flow, let me just run this test, create verify order. And this is really, really fast. Why? Because I basically connect to a system that's already running and I you know, create the coffee order there. So I separate these test life cycles. I don't want to have a test. That's why I use play unit, uh, play J, uh, plain J unit that starts up a lot of stuff that runs my environment that uses containers, maybe test containers to start up everything. Why? Because for me, I want the immediate feedback and immediate feedback with modern technology. Quarkus starts up super fast, right? Like five seconds or it depends on what you're using. And it can be uh, it can be less if you use a database can be a little bit more. But that is already not fast enough, right? Because we're humans, we get distracted. If I have to wait for five seconds each and every time I do something, that is just, you know, it's it's too annoying. I get distracted and I check email, I look um, check my phone, look at Slack, whatever. But I want to stay in this development flow. So this is really, really an important a point while I'm developing, I want to be in a flow experience of immediate feedback. That's basically it immediate feedback. What do I do? I write a test here. And then I want to um, execute the test, I can do it again. And I immediately want to see whether it works or not. So here run this test. And yes, it works. If it would be an exception, okay, then I could check what's wrong with my test or check the logs. Also, what works here, and that's really, really cool, because of this Quarkus technology, I can run Quarkus actually in a development mode. And I can also connect this into with all these dots connected uh, within containers. So I can run my coffee shop application within a container with Quarkus and still use this development mode that has the connection to my source. So how does this look like? Well, I basically can go and say, this is this uh, uh, script. And again, I will share, the, uh, of course, all of the code with you. So if I go and ask for, you know, this application that is still running now, that works in my uh, in my container. But now I can also go and change something in the running application. That's the development mode, for example, can go to this index page and say, well, add something here, you know, like Hello World, whatever. And then it immediately um, have the changes uh, uh, have to changes here depends on your technology that is um, or what you use in Quarkus that is usually very very fast like within you know second a second or something and then you see hello world and this is now the running application it very quickly has been restarted and now I see the changes hello world and of course I can re-execute my test and this is now for me the perfect setup where I have um, a setup and a workflow where it doesn't matter what I change I get immediate feedback. I can change something in the code, I can, you know, code all day long, even if it doesn't compile, it doesn't matter, it just tries again, tries again, at some point, it will work, my application will restart, and I can see the changes immediately being reflected, right? Now I can remove this uh, Hello World again. So here it is, Hello World. And then once that has been restarted, it says, well, the original response uh, without the Hello World. And with that, I get the feedback in my application, I can change the production code. And also I can rerun my test and I get immediate feedback. 
Why? Because I separate these uh, life cycles. And for me, that's very important. Why? Because if I have code level tests, you know, it's easy to do something on a, uh, on a code level test and run JUnit, you know, that will always ex hopefully execute very fast. But the challenge is to have the more integrative tests. And I'm not a big fan of these code level integration tests for similar reason what I mentioned before. So, you know, something like Spring tests or Quarkus tests that try to emulate an application and start it up. Why? First, for two reasons. First of all, it also takes a lot of time. I mean, a lot of time means like five seconds or something like that, but it takes these five seconds each and every time. And out of my experience, the biggest contributor to slow build times is actually um, in proper integration testing. So integration tests that start up many, many, many times. And the second thing is these code level integration tests are always just a substitute for your proper um, acceptance or system test. So that means you run your application just a little bit differently, right? And then some comedy, um, some configuration will um, will be different to production. Some other things might be different, and then you have to test it again anyway, right? Because it's not the ultimate verification before you deploy to production. So that's basically um, the point here, and um, that's why I actually want to focus on the system and acceptance tests, at least for testing the business um, uh, use cases, for testing the business logic that involves these multiple microservices that involves the proper uh, interaction. If I have some code level logic that be can be tested in a very concise way, like, you know, a class that has a, um, a lot of logic, like an algorithm or something like that, then it makes a lot of sense to have code level tests for these things as well. And in general, you know, they are very good because they give you very early feedback if you made just some uh, erroneous mistake. But um, for the ultimate um, interaction, you need some proper um, uh, integrative tests. So that's uh, what I have here. And then also what I want to show you um, is that you can reuse actually the system tests. And now this is really cool against different environments. So what I have here, um, this is, by the way, some resources that I will share with you. So this is um, on my blog, how to wrote this, how to uh, run this remote dev mode of Quarkus in containers. You, of course, get all of the code. And also what I have, what I quickly want to show you, I have a Kubernetes cluster, of course, right? Because no proper demo uh, without deploying to Kubernetes. So assuming my um, environment, such as my production environment, has something uh, like a Kubernetes cluster that now is just empty. I quick, very quickly want to do this. You know, Maybe if you're familiar, you know about this kube control um, CLI. And what I want to do, I just uh, very quickly want to um, go to my project and just deploy it. So I say go to the deployment and I have a system test uh, deployment actually. What does it do? Well, it deploys a bunch of things. Uh, most importantly, it deploys uh, my barista, my coffee shop and my coffee shop database. But since I have a lot of, um, let's see what's going on here. Um, I have a lot of um, ways how to um, how to swap out things in Kubernetes as well. I basically can go and swap my barista to not the actual barista, but also to the system test here. And this is very similar what I just showed you locally. I don't run the proper system test here. I show you the um, Kubernetes deployment. You can check out the code, you know, uh, code with um, all, of, uh, all of the time you need, but it basically runs Wiremock, right? So this is the deployment of the barista with my proper um, barista image and this is just wire mock right so this is the same what I run locally and this is how the coffee shop looks like right this is my docker image and all these things and what I can do now I actually can go and um, now it's up and running I can go to not localhost I can go to my kubernetes cluster and well check if everything is up and running and yes orders and health checks seems to work okay great but now it is connected to a system test backend. So what I can actually do is I can go to the system test project and say um, uh, verify, maybe verify to run this and I run it now on the command line. It's the same thing. I can also run it in the IDE, but now I want to set some properties and that's easier here. And what it does, I just reconfigure the test to not go against local hosts. So maybe you paid attention and you have seen these uh, configuration options for the system properties. So I can reuse the same test. Why? It doesn't tingle with the environment. It just assumes that the application is already running and it assumes that there is um, a wire mock installed. 
um, or while I'm running here. And now it runs the same test against my Kubernetes uh, setup. And in order to show you that I wasn't lying, here now I go against my cloud uh, deployment that I just deployed and you see a lot of uh, coffee orders that have been created in this uh, system test environment. So this of course only works uh, with the system test uh, here because otherwise you know you would get actual coffee um, but that might be another test of another environment as well. So with the system tests I can reuse that to fire up against uh, another environment as well. So again you know maintainability and I don't have to um, run things twice. So now as some key takeaways, and I here showed you mostly the system test and acceptance test, but if you want to learn uh, more about this topic, how to do effective testing, I have some resources for you. But most importantly, test code quality matters. It also not only matters in production, but also in your test scope. And especially once your project grows more complex, you will see uh, the changes here. And uh, try to craft components, test components that are reusable. So not only um, for the system tests or acceptance tests, but also for your code level tests um, with the um, further resources that I'll share. I have some examples how to uh, do this in code level tests also. And for this flow aspect of this presentation, the most important thing is to have fast feedback and uh, short turnaround cycles. And this basically means to have separate life cycles from your tests and your test environment. So for me, that's always very, very simple. I mostly use uh, shell scripts actually to uh, run my test environment locally. You can use Docker Compose if you want. You can even have a local Kubernetes cluster or OpenShift cluster. But for me, that's the easiest and straightforward way. And then I don't have to use any fancy text technology that actually doesn't make the testing faster for me because of these turnaround times. I'm totally fine with waiting a bunch of seconds once before my coding uh, session starts. And then, you know, I wait 20 seconds until everything has been started up. But then I want to keep it running. And that's also a little bit closer to production because also production keeps running and you just have to adapt your test scenarios that, you know, they, they work with this um, uh, with this way. Um, I, that's why I'm, you know, it's also a good idea to have item potent tests and reusable test scenarios that don't have to um, fire up everything every time. And in general, test code quality is more important than using certain test frameworks. So I mostly, and this is really the case, I usually use only JUnit, Mokito and SRJ because SRJ has a nice fluent API. And that's it. And everything else, I either, you know, start up my environment from the outside um, or using some different technology. And then I care a lot about crafting, crafting proper code quality, such as abstraction and delegation. And that is actually the biggest win that you have and more important than using any other uh, test framework. So thanks a lot for your attention. I hope this was uh, helpful. You can get all of the code and some further resources if you follow just this uh, first link um, for tests that spark flow. I um, hope it was helpful um, to you. I'm looking forward to some further discussions. So please uh, feel free to ping me on Twitter or elsewhere. And yeah, have a great day. Bye.